Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Leanne. Welcome to Empowered Now. Where we save humanity one one relationship relationship at a time. time. We all struggle from time to time connecting with and understanding others and ourselves. So we hope to encourage you to live a more authentic and empowered life by sharing what we've learned as coaches and as individuals. Empowered Now is LGBTQ2IA alternative lifestyle, poly and kink friendly. Thanks for joining us and And enjoy enjoy the the show. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Our topic today is gender identity and sexual orientation. We're going to throw in romantic orientation. And as a special bonus, we have a guest star today being interviewed. Hello. Ivy Padmos, our daughter, is joining us today. Hey, Ivy. Hi, good afternoon, morning, wherever you are. How's it going? (laughs) We are uh, filming this on New Year's Eve. And Mm -hmm. so great to see you on New Year's Eve. Yeah, you guys too. Happy New Year's. Thank Thank you. You You as well. So why are we talking about this? For me personally, I work with a lot of people from the LGBT q2ia plus community and so a lot of our discussion is about authentic living finding your power and i feel like this topic really helps people do that live their authentic lives greg what about you well yeah like you said um i feel like you know having a sense of of our identity is is imperative to understanding who we are and how we interact with those around us and the world around us um, and being able to have, you know, a, a broader spectrum of identities, um, as opposed to that sort of binary thing that's been happening for so long, uh, I think is a really beautiful thing. And I think it opens people up to a broader, more expansive perspective on who they can be. Um, and it also creates, uh, in my opinion, it creeps, it creates much deeper and much more meaningful connections because of it. Mm-hmm. What about you, Ivy? Um, well, I am queer, so <laughs> I am very involved in the queer community and have been for some time now. And I think the biggest thing for me is like conversations like these are really important because identity is not um, a destination, in my opinion. I think it's a journey. And I think that people are constantly learning about themselves and constantly changing their minds. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that's what makes us human and that's really beautiful. And so sometimes these conversations can stimulate growth and change in people that maybe they didn't even see coming, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And also education for people who are allies or who have a queer person in their life and want resources as to how to help them and through whatever it is they're going through and how to stand by and hold space in a way that is good for everyone involved yeah absolutely right on yes good answers (laughs) speaking of which actually ivy you mentioned education um i remember there was a pretty pretty significant aha moment in my life um and it involves you and i remember that we were talking about like kids toys and the programming, yeah. and you brought up something that I had never, I had never really fucking thought about before ever. I was like, <laughs> oh, wow, I didn't even consider that. But you talked about this idea of pink and blue toys. And so w- would you mind sort of expanding on that and educating the rest of the world? Because I know for me, it was a, it was a brilliant moment. I was like, oh shit, okay. Jeez. Um, okay, no sure. <laughs> uh, I think, w- generally there's this idea that toys exist kind of in a binary for kids and growing up myself you know there's an idea that if you play with trucks you're a tomboy if you are born female right and you know if you play with dolls that's kind of what you should be doing so uh, toys have always existed in this binary um there's you know dolls there's dress up there's trucks there's superheroes and there is this idea behind them that kids should play with you know what aligns with with their with their gender or you know how they were born um 
and I don't, I don't believe that personally. Um, and since we've had that conversation, cause that was like five years ago, <laughs> um, uh, I taught preschool, right? So I got to see that kind of at play every single day at work. I taught preschool for a year and you had kids who are, were born male and they wanted to play with dolls. And a lot of the girls shunned them and vice versa. There were mm. girls who loved the superhero toys and not only the, their peers, but also the teachers were really instrumental in this kind of um, reinforcing the binary, mm. you know, again, mm -hmm. with being like, oh, well, you're, you can't play with that. Well, um, wow. You can't yeah. play with that. You yeah, with absolutely. Really? Yeah, yeah, totally. Play with that. Brutal. It's I mean, it's interesting because you mentioned yeah. playing with dolls, but I remember two of my favorite toys on the planet were six million. I, I'm going to show my age here, but whatever. I was <laughs> a six million dollar man um, and a uh, GI Joe, both of which were dolls. They just happened to be male identifying dolls. Yeah. So it's not the and dolls to say; it's what you put on the dolls, and it's how you identify their gender and what they represent as being yes. programmed, right? Um, yeah. And I mean, my, my grandson, uh, when he was young, and I remember witnessing this, he would play with anything that you put in front of him. He didn't care. Yeah. But then yeah. he was a certain age where he started to care. And it was because the people around him and the programming that he was receiving, like you and I talked about with the commercial. Yeah. And, and, the, and that's where the pink and the blue come from, right? Is like, you know, that those commercials are constantly inundating our kids and have been for since time began, basically. Um, you know, with, with since our messages. time began. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Since our time began with these messages that, you know, it's 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 blue for boys and pink for girls and Barbies for girls and G.I. Joe's for boys or whatever the latest yeah. toys are, right? You know, mm -hmm. and trucks versus, you know, um and but I think there's a little do, do you find that maybe there's a little bit of crossover starting to happen in recent years at all? Like I think it really depends on where you are. I think the environment that I was working in, no. Um, they're like the people who were running the, the place that I worked at had their kids in the program. And one of her sons actually loved, um, Sky from Paw Patrol for mm -hmm. anybody with young kids out there or grandbabies. You'll That's a, that what, what, what identity does that character identify with? Female. Female. So the, the yeah, okay. the character is pink and a dog and badass and saving the world, but she's a girl. Mm -hmm. And one of my students, the, the son of my uh, director, he wanted to be Sky for Halloween. And I remember standing there and watching her berate him and saying, you oh. can't be Sky. I'm wow. sorry. There's no way for that to happen. And so, I mean, I think if you go back, you mentioned commercials, right? If you look at when commercials became really, really popular, I'm not talking like, you know, magazines and things like that, but like visual commercials, it was like the 50s, 40s and 50s, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when we saw a huge pull in these like gender norms and push for like men to be hyper-masculine. You know, the war had happened. We needed women in the, in the house again. They had been working, but we need them back and we need them to cook and we need them to be housewives. Yeah, the nuclear and that's, family. Sorry? The nuclear family. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's, it's still happening now. And so there is a lot of pushback, I think specifically from queer community or queer allied people where they're, they're seeing kids and just letting them be kids. Like, I think if you put any toys in front of a group of children, they're going to be like, dope, I like this one and go play with it. And it doesn't really matter <laughs> to them what it is. Now, you know? One of your your favorite toys as a toddler was uh, a jar of nuts and bolts. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not even really a toy. So like that's <laughs> right. You know, so it kids don't care. But it can be like yeah. anything can be a toy, really. I mean, that's the beauty of being a child is, is that you have that imagination and you can, yeah. you know, as long as you're willing to clean that shit up, anything can be a toy, really. <laughs> yeah. So um yes, thank you for sharing that. Sorry. I would like to just review a little bit of terminology, quite a lot of terminology. So It'll take a few minutes, 
but I think it's really important to kind of help with that education piece and I am not an expert and I do not represent the community I think Ivy you had talked about um, maybe putting that disclaimer in there as well that we are not representing the community but we are part of it and um, I just want to kind of touch on some of the terminology so that we're all on the same page okay go for it sounds good okay <laughs> So I have a cheat sheet here that I'm just going to refer to. Um, all right, we'll start with the biological sex determination that happens at birth, typically, and uh, is binary, usually, unless there are uh, other components that are mixed of both genders. So that might be an intersex person. We uh, use the term gender as an identity and that is determined later in life, not at okay. birth. Can I interrupt you just for a second though? Sure. Just to get some clarity around the biological piece. You mean yeah. the genitals that we're born with determine what? Not just the genitals, but the okay. chromosomes and the, and the um, hormones. Okay, and that determines? That determines the sex. Okay. Assigned at birth. Okay, thanks for the clarity. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Uh, sexual orientation is about our sexual attraction and romantic orientation, which we're including today for fun. Well, not just for fun, because it's important, uh, is about, you know, who you're drawn to, to be romantic with. And they are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. Transsexual is an outdated term used to describe uh, transgender people but it has been stigmatized primarily by the medical community using it in terms of uh, mental health issues. And so transgendered folks would prefer us not to use that term generally unless they have a specific desire to use that term. So it's nice to ask or to use the term trans, which is sort of the big umbrella. Uh, and to be cisgendered is to have an alignment with the identity of your gender and the uh, gender or the sex assigned at birth. That is the Latin term. Cis is the Latin term for on the same side as, and trans is the Latin term for on the opposite side of. So trans is what we use to describe people who are uh, identifying with the opposite gender than what they were assigned at birth. Uh, and did I get that right? I think I got that right. Uh, I'm just going to go through the gender column here. There's a spectrum between cis and trans, and uh, there's a lot of terminology. I'm just going to touch on a few because I think there's something, there's more than 50. So he, these are the more common ones. Um, to be non-binary is neither to be male nor female. They can identify with both genders, neither or be fluid. Um, a gender is they don't identify with any particular gender or they consider themselves to be gender neutral. Pan gender or omnigender or polygender is that uh, this person would identify with many or all genders. Demigender is someone who has a partial connection to either the female or the male gender. Gray gender is someone who's really ambivalent about their identity. Gender queer also known as fluid, is someone who identifies with no gender or a combination. Two-spirit is the First Nations terminology for someone who embodies both the female and the male. And questioning refers to people who are just questioning. We're still in the, the uh, we are not sure where we fall in that spectrum. Then we get to, any questions before we move on? <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah. Do, do you mind if I just step in um, and just ask, just just to, so maybe people can get a sense of how this might work and how this might look? Sure. Uh, so, how do you identify your gender? What a gender? What gender do you identify with? Me? Oh, I I am cisgendered. Um, I was assigned the female sex at birth, and I identify with the female gender. And Ivy, you? I identify my gender as non-binary femme. Okay, Just can you can toss you explain, that in there? Yeah, I was going to say, can you can you explain what that means, the non-binary femme piece? Sure, yeah. 
Um, I identify with both the masculine and the feminine. And when I say that, I mean more like masculine and feminine energies and dualities that exist in people, not so much the, the binary itself. So that's kind of a more <laughs> abstract and, and queer lens on, <laughs> on the binary. Um, but I identify with both uh, the masculine and the feminine, but I tend to have a, a more um, outward expression and gender expression that is feminine. And I like to, you know, be pretty and wear makeup and all those things. <laughs> but I do experience um, some gender dysphoria um, on occasion. And what does that and mean? Gender nope. dysphoria <laughs> um, it is when you feel uncomfortable with a uh, expression or a, it really can, it can exist within yourself or it can exist in like in an outward setting where people are calling you the wrong pronoun or um, you feel internally like you, usually this happens in the early stages of somebody um, f discovering that they're they're trans a lot of the time the questioning kind of part of the queerness has to do a lot with gender dysphoria and feeling uncomfortable with a certain expression or with pronouns being used and so for me what that looks like is um, for example sometimes I'll go to put on a skirt and I'll start to walk out the door and I'm like wow I actually feel really disgusting in my body right now and I kind of need to like take a step back and recognize that it just does not align with my gender expression and it feels very intrinsically wrong. And that's something that I, I think led me to recognize also that I am non-binary and that I really do enjoy um, expressing myself as masculine and as feminine. And there are times where I just like do not fit in the more fem box and there's times where I do not fit in the more masculine box and there's times where I like to be in between and I think that's yeah it's just kind of how I live my life <laughs> so yeah thanks for that and so pronouns oh um I use she and they primarily uh primarily she just because I express as them but I also accept he and him pronouns okay, cool Great. thank you and Greg? And me, I'm cisgendered male, um, and he and him are my pronouns. Great. And I didn't mention my pronouns. She and her. <laughs> All right. Thanks. We're going to talk about sexual and romantic orientation now. And there's a lot of those prefixes that keep popping up. So um, we get the hang of those, which is really helpful. <laughs> Heterosexual uh, people are attracted to the opposite gender. Homosexual people, lesbian or gay, are attracted to the same gender. Bisexual people are attracted to both male and female. Asexual people have no sexual attraction. Pansexual people are attracted to all genders. Demisexual people need an emotional connection to feel sexually attracted. Gray sexual people are ambivalent about their sexual attraction. Queer people, which is sort of the sort of big umbrella again, um, fall anywhere on the spectrum outside of being heterosexual. And sapiosexual people uh, need that intellectual connection to feel sexually attracted. And then of course, there's the questioning people who are not sure where they're at. Comments, questions, should we talk about our sexual orientation? Uh, I was yeah, gonna sure. add something. Okay, you add um, something. <laughs> uh, I was just going to mention that bisexual people, not all the time, but usually the term bisexual is meant to describe someone who's attracted to people who are within the binary of male and female, and sometimes mm -hmm. can exclude attraction to non-binary or transgendered folks as well. Not all the time, but it, it can, which is why terms like pansexual exist, which is attraction mm -hmm. to like all genders um, and things like that. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I identify as bisexual, even though I have for many years identified as heteroflexible, which is a term that I didn't include on here. Um, and I will talk about that right now, I suppose, because uh, 
Heteral flexible is a term I felt comfortable with. I'm attracted to men and women sexually. And then my darling daughter, Ivy, <laughs> well, but, but educated maybe, me. Don't interrupt. Maybe, just a minute. Just a minute. Right. She educated me about the terminology uh, being used as a form of bi erasure. And so yeah. while heteroflexible felt really good to me to discover, and I, I felt very connected to that label, um, I have since decided to release that need to hold on so tightly to the hetero part of things. Um, and I think that that opens me up to being uh, more authentic. So I feel kind of vulnerable sharing that, but also kind of happy to share that. So that's my story there. Greg, you wanted to say something? Well, first off, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Yay, uh, mom! Um, Yay! Yeah. Yeah. So, so for me, um, even as I hear you going through the terms, I wonder, um, I mean, I, I have up until this moment identified as bisexual because I'm attracted to both men and women. Yeah. But the problem is, is that I'm also attracted to trans people too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I primarily am attracted to people that, ident that, that present as female. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also certain situations where that's not the case, where, um, you know, I've seen some pretty gorgeous men that are very masculine. And, you know, so I, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I want to say probably pansexual um, yeah. would probably be for me. Um, pan uh definitely demi and sapio um but yeah i don't i don't i don't know because i think it's like like that spectrum like i'm literally thinking of a needle going across a spectrum right you know where do i fall right and i think it's like it's doing this right now it's going da, 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 da. <laughs> like, the price is right it's like da, 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 right? so i think i think i think the closest term i could find would be pan right now mm. um, you know so if that makes any sense I should mention also sapio and demi sexual. I'm both of those as well. I yeah. think you mentioned demi, but go back in. Yeah, oh, so for you, yeah, for myself, so, it applies to me. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so for me, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think pan is the word that's sticking, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think oh, pan is the word that's sticking right now in, in terms of, but then I think, well, but when it comes to trans people, I'm particularly attracted to trans people who present as feminine. Yep, like that can be part of it. It can be right? a subsection. So like how much of this am I unpacking here, right? <laughs> awesome. We're coming out again, boys. We're coming yeah. out again. <laughs> there's a lot. But, but there's a lot there, right? So yeah. it, it's very nuanced and it's, it's very, it's, yes. it's kind of delicate really. It's a, it's a family coming out party. Yay! <laughs> Right? Oh my god! So anyway, so yeah, so I think I think pan is the word that sticks for me, uh, but I've been awesome. so used to using bisexual just because it's it's the easiest way. It's easier. It is easier. Oh, it is. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So there's a little bit of vulnerability for you there too. So thank you Aww. for sharing. Yeah, the reason why I'm smiling so hard, by the way, is just because like it truly <laughs> is a journey, and I think what's so great is that we have the ability to question. I think that's such an innate part of the queer community and like queerness mm. as a whole is just like the ability to feel liberated in your journey of questioning things and not having to stick to one thing or another mm -hmm. and being true to yourself. I think that is the queer community modus operandi truly is just like liberation of self and like freedom to feel and freedom to express and you know to learn and to grow with yourself so yeah thank you both for sharing that that's so beautiful thank you and tell us about you ivy <sighs> oh <laughs> well um <laughs> um okay just how i identify now is what you want to know yeah your sexual orientation my sexual orientation is queer and within that, I identify also as uh, demisexual, um, but I primarily use the term queer just because it's easier to explain than demisexual. <laughs> so, yeah. What do you mean by queer? 
Um, I completely do not fall in the heterosexual category whatsoever. I am attracted to all genders, all expressions, um, and I have a primary romantic attraction towards women or more um, feminine energy. But uh, yeah, just queer. So, so would that be pansexual then? <laughs> I don't. I I don't um, identify with the term pansexual. I for me that's too limiting. I think my sexual tendencies are more emotional, which is why I identify with demisexual. Mm, um, okay. But they apply to everybody, and so for me. I, I just don't resonate with the term pansexual. I prefer the, the word queer. Okay. Yeah. I thought pan encompassed everything. Mm -hmm. So I thought that that would be applicable, but whatever you're yeah, comfortable I mean, with. It totally does. Yeah. And that's the other thing too, is that there are a lot of terms that are really similar, but again, it's like the nuanced expression of how does it make you feel? That's, right. that's mm -hmm. what matters right. underneath it all. Right. Right. I can see what you mean. Cause like I, when I, when I try to apply the word queer to myself, mm -hmm. I'm like that doesn't fit. Right. It doesn't fit mm. for me, but what does it's fit like is trying on a shoe, you know? Right. right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Truly. Right. Absolutely. Okay. So let's move on. That was a great segue. Thank you to, into romantic orientation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you for sharing Ivy. Yeah. Welcome. So we have our hetero romantic uh attracted to the opposite gender for romance and our homo romantic attracted to the same gender for romance bi romantic attracted to either male or female a romantic they don't have romantic connections pan romantic or poly romantic attracted to all gender identities demi romantic who need an emotional bond to feel romantic gray romantic who are ambivalent about romantic connections at all and sapio romantic who need the intellectual connection to be romantic. And when we talk about romance, we're talking about feelings of love, nurturing, that kind of connection, uh, as opposed to the sexual orientation, which would be, I am sexually attracted to that person. And of course there's in the romantic uh, spectrum, there's people who are questioning. Yeah. Do you want to do, the, do, do the round thing again, the, the around the table thing again? <laughs> Yeah, let's do the around the table thing again. So I am uh, hetero romantic, uh, demi romantic, and sapio romantic. Pretty similar to my sexual orientations. Uh, not exactly lining up though. So many. Yeah. Yes. So for me, uh, when I think about romance, I don't think about women. I think about men. Oh. So that would be the difference in terms of my sexual orientation being bisexual, but my romantic orientation being hetero romantic. Right. Yeah. And I, I'm the same way. I would I would identify as hetero demi, um, and <laughs> sapio actually. Uh, so I don't see my attraction with with people that don't identify as female is is not romantic. It's typically very physical and almost primal in a way. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Ivy? No, I I was making lewd gestures that's oh. fine uh, oh <laughs> i was like eat or eat or but it's fine um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness um, all right it's my turn yes yeah. it's your turn okay um i would identify as more i honestly am more homo romantic i'm i'm pretty freaking gay for ladies um but i think recently I, I, I'm also pretty demi-romantic as well, which also like bleeds into my demisexual. I really, really do need that intrinsic emotional connection with somebody to feel attracted to them. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly haven't put too much thought into my romantic orientation. It's, it's more something that I, which is weird, right? Cause I, maybe that's pretty normal, I guess, <laughs> in, in, the, in the queer scope of things. Because I, th I think it's pretty new, honestly. I found out about romantic orientations only a few years ago. Um, so. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. think it's new too. Is that, is that because yeah. it doesn't really matter to you? No, I would say that romantic bleeds really heavily into my sex life. Um, if I do not have a romantic connection with somebody, 
I'm pretty much just going to sleep with you one time usually, or, <laughs> or if I'm in a relationship with that person, right. And the romance dies, we're not having sex. So mm-hmm. it's really, really, really tied in for me. Um, because so you're I, demisexual I yes. and demi-romantic. Yeah. 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 Um, Makes sense. Yeah. But I think, I think generally I have felt more romantic with women than I have with men, um, specifically cisgendered men. I think I, maybe it's just more like the, the kind of like feminine energies that I, again, am more attracted to. So that doesn't just have to do with women that can also be people who are cisgendered, but have more feminine energy or Mm. trans men who are more effeminate. Um, I would say I'm more romantically attracted to but again, that be a change in because life's crazy and it's okay <laughs> to change your mind about stuff. It's absolutely okay. Yes. I, think that's a, I think that's important to know too, um, as we're talking about terminology and identity and stuff, it's really, really fucking important to note because we, we can't be making assumptions. And I think the assumptions need to stop. So yeah. if you, if you look at somebody and you met them a year ago and they, you know, their pronouns were he, him, and they presented as male. And then today they present differently or they don't present differently. Um, but they, they sit you down and say, Hey, look, this is my identity today. Yeah. Um, we have to learn, you know, that that's, that's, that's part of why we're doing what we're doing today is to, is to bring that connection, you know, to help with that connection and help to bridge those gaps in terms of, you know, these yeah. things that we take as assumptions and, and take for granted in some ways, right. The privilege that we have, you know, um, in that regard. So, so yeah, so don't take it for granted. Mm. Yeah. Someone uh, posted a meme (laughs) recently about how often, uh, you know, people complain about using the proper pronouns. I saw this one. Yeah. But they very easily will change from miss to missus when someone marries and change their last name uh, without any concern whatsoever so and nobody complains know, about that like, <laughs> nobody complains about that so we're perfectly yeah. capable you right? have how many different last names in your life honey right so <laughs> and nobody okay. nobody complains about it right but the point is, is that wait i want to run through them oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so i began life as leanne mashmeyer then i married and became leanne sanga nobody had a problem with that then I became Leanne Padmos. Woohoo! Nobody cared. Then I became Leanne Melithopoulos. A little harder to say, but Don't everybody worked one. it out. <laughs> now yeah. I'm Leanne Million. Everybody loves the last name, just saying. But yeah. no problem at all switching it up, right? right. Yeah. But heaven forbid I should change my pronouns. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. The struggle anyway. is real. So uh, that was a lot of terminology that we just went through. Yeah. So I, I was just going to mention that if, if anybody watching this or listening to this wants to get a copy of that, um, because we have a we have a, a sheet, sort of a cheat sheet kind of thing that we, we put together, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> reach out to us through our website. So Leanne Million. So that's L-E-A-N-N-E-M-I-L-L-I-O-N.com. And then Greg Million, G-R-E-G-M-I-L-L-I-O-N.com. I hope I spelled those right. You do. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, and we can also post in the comments, the, the, the website or in the description to the website too. Um, but yeah, we'll have those available. Just reach out to us, um, through those, through those mediums and we'll be happy to provide you with the sheets. Sometimes it's helpful as a reference tool, especially if you're an ally mm-hmm. and you're not really yeah. sure how to have a conversation with somebody, or if you're using the right terminology, you can have that with you and, and maybe refer to it or ask them you know, just have the conversations, right? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of allies, Ali, or ally, allies, ally, see, I can't even say the word allyship, <laughs> allyship, ally, allyship. I can't say there you it. Go. You did it. Ugly. So, hey, Ivy, why don't you take over and discuss allyship? Because I Hi. got nothing. <laughs> so what does well, good allyship cool. look like to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned earlier, disclaimer, like I do not speak for the entire queer community. I'm speaking anecdotally from my own experience as a queer person, which has been marginally a better experience than a lot of people that I even know personally. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, 
thank you to both of you for being huge supports in my journey, um, which it has been allyship. So there you go. I think the best way to be an ally for people who are trans or queer or part of the LGBTQIA plus community is truly to listen, to ask questions that don't cause the person to have to explain themselves to you. And what I mean by that is in a way that does not create defensiveness in the conversation. When you are, are t starting these conversations with people that are queer or trans or non-binary or however they identify, the biggest thing to note is that it, it is really hard. It does not matter who you are. That is pretty across the board. Um, these, okay. are these are difficult conversations mm -hmm. because um, they still have to be conversations, right? And so as an ally, kind of the, the role that you take on is that of a listener, <laughs> mainly. And if you are asking somebody a question and they are coming out to you and explaining themselves to you, let that happen. Let that expression happen mm -hmm. and hold that space for them. Because as I said earlier, right, it is a journey. It is not a destination. And if you want to help them on this journey, you need to kind of take up your spade a little bit. <laughs> and start digging your own way in the in the queer community as an ally that's also part of of the spectrum right allyship is is a, a part of the community for good reason because without allyship truly like we would not have the same place in in society that we do today i don't think um, mm -hmm. with any movement, with any group of people that are marginalized, it's important to take a step back as an ally and to hold the space for that group to have a voice, you know, and, and to just listen. I think that's the biggest takeaway. Um, and, and also too, um, what we were talking about earlier with, you know, you said something about people being concerned about like pronoun use for example, mm -hmm. right? I think the biggest issue that I see people take with the queer community, um, and I'm speaking as somebody who passes as straight. You know, I walk down the street, people don't know that I'm gay. They just don't. I don't present in their view of what queer looks like as, as a, a queer person. Mm -hmm. I don't look like a queer person to a lot of people. And so I get talked to the way that straight girls get talked to, which mm -hmm. is not always nice to hear. And they're kind of expecting me, you know, a lot of straight people who speak to me about the queer community and who maybe are not allied with the queer community expect me to kind of like agree with them, right? Because I don't, I don't look like I'm gay. Um, and so the biggest thing that I hear is that there's this like push, you know, for, for the queers to, you know, push their agenda and to make people, you know, have to say, use their pronouns and people get mad when you get it wrong. And I think the, the biggest thing is that like, yeah, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, it's insulting to have your identity questioned all the time. Mm -hmm. I think as a queer person, it's, it's our duty to recognize you not duty, but it, it's a better kind of like place to take um, an easier road. Maybe if you recognize that a lot of straight people are not allied or if they are, they might not know how to approach these topics. And I think come at it with sympathy on both sides, right? Cause it's, it's hard for queer people to figure out their own identities, right? So if somebody that you love is being told that you are now non-binary, let's say I'll just use my own experience, and they don't understand what that is, that can be really scary. And it can be really scary for you to come out to them. Mm -hmm. So there has to be this space that is created, usually by the ally, to allow constructive conversation about 
you know, this person coming out to you. And what that looks like, again, is listening, questioning in a non-threatening way, in a way that doesn't make the person explain themselves, holding space for them coming out, and acceptance. That's the final step. It is not your duty as an ally to make the queer person rethink things. It is not your duty as an ally to pressure them in some way to explain, you know, what, it, what do all these terms mean? You know, mm -hmm. there is an ability, you showed it, there's an ability to Google, right? The person, right? <laughs> right? Like right. the person that you're speaking to might not align with the idea, with the definition that you find, right? However, it's a starting point. There's a lot of research that allies can do now, which is really awesome. And I think a lot of people don't do that. So they're coming in blind and they're making assumptions about a community that they don't know about and that they have no experience with usually if this is the first time someone's coming out to them and the first time they're meeting a queer person, right? Mm -hmm. So just like with anything, do a little research, you know, have that in your back pocket too, so that you kind of have a sense of what's going on. But if you're doing that, don't come into conversations sounding like you know everything, you know, oh like there's, yeah. yeah, there's a, there's this fine balance that ultimately allies, the job is to hold space, just like with any marginalized group that you speak to. You know, if you are not a part of the group that is being targeted, and if you're not a part of the group that is being marginalized societally, hold space, make it safe for that person to speak mm -hmm. to you, to be with you, to, you know, escape to you if need be. And that is true allyship at the end of the day. And also too, if you are a straight person that is allied with the queer community, there's a lot that you can do to deconstruct these homophobic conversations and transphobic conversations that happen in groups of straight people. And mm. that also is allyship. You know, if your best friend is me, let's say I'm queer, I'm non-binary, and you're sitting around listening to your other friends talk trash about your other friend's identity, it don't feel good, you know? As... Uh, as a person of, of, of queerness, <laughs> it doesn't feel good to know that those conversations are happening and that my friends aren't standing up for me. Is that their job all the time? No. But I think that, you know, if you want to align yourself even further as an ally, that is another step that you can take is just deconstructing these negative conversations around the queer community and queer culture. So... And you can come at those conversations with compassion as well and say, of course. I don't understand why you would say that. Yeah. Right. You can ask yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Yeah. Good summary. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I think we're at about time. So I'm going to wrap things up if that's okay. Yeah. You guys good with that? Is there anything you want to add? Greg, yeah, is there anything that we haven't covered that we want to that we feel is is vital? Well, um, I was going to ask both of you what kinds of, you know, questions or stigma have you come up against yourselves personally in your journeys? Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I present heterosexual and I haven't been out really. So I haven't had these conversations um, directed to me or questions directed to me. Um, I know that both of you have been publicly out. So, um, if you want to comment on that, that would be great. Greg, uh, do you want to go first or do you have anything you want to say or add or, um, sure. Yeah. I mean, I came out when I was 13. So I was in junior high at the time. And I think a lot of those starting conversations, um, I was hypersexualized because of my sexuality in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, I dated a woman um, in grade eight, which is pretty decently young. Um, and I had, you know- Ivy? 
just to clarify she wasn't a woman she was a girl is that correct oh sure yeah she's a woman now (laughs) i dated a girl my age when i was 13. (laughs) excellent Um, well done thank you um (laughs) um we might have been getting a phone call had we not corrected that no Mm -hmm. we're fine (laughs) (laughs) what is it anyway she was also 13 but we were both girls and um that was hard on everybody around me except me i was the first person in my school to come out fun fact um oh. yeah that i didn't I know mean, that that was publicly out yeah and um so we i had a lot of boys young boys you know come up to me and kiss your girlfriend can you kiss your girlfriend in front of me and that is <sighs> huge That has carried on through my adulthood where there is an expectation that because I am queer, I am more into threesomes or I am uh, sexually more, you know, uh, experimentative or whatever it is, right? Because of my identity, not because I am that way, which I might be, you know, if that was the conversation, but um there is a huge assumption i think also within the queer community sometimes that you know bisexual people queer people anyone who is attracted to more than one gender um is hypersexual you know and that that is seen in a lot of different ways um and then the other thing too of course is that i've been told to pick one so yeah. oh wow i get that a lot yeah yeah and and that's pretty common I would say for, make, for make people. a decision. It's like, totally, yeah. Yeah. I, I came it. out as bisexual and one of my best friends sat me down and said, Ivy, you have too many options. Okay. You can't date everybody. Can you pick one? And I was like, uh, that's oh not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Like I wish. So right. yeah. Right. But do you wish? I mean, I was a lesbian for a few years, so I think, honestly, a lot of that stigma pushed me into having to rethink things. I started dating women, and I was like, fuck it, you know, maybe I am a lesbian. Maybe I should identify as that, and it never really quite resonated with me. Um, In terms of stigma from within the queer community, changing your mind about things is pretty big because you represent a part of the community right Mm -hmm. so as much as it is accepted it's also seen as kind of I mean for me it came across as a betrayal when I stopped identifying as a lesbian right because it was like you know you've been a lesbian for the last two years and now you're calling yourself queer or you're dating a man you know, you're not a lesbian. And I'm like, no, you're right. You know, I didn't know that though for a couple of years. I thought I was, I felt like one, I was dating women. I accepted that term. I presented that way, you know, all those things. I was like, I'm checking all the boxes, guys. I'm a lesbian, right? And <laughs> people are really protective of their identities because it's threatened so much. And right. I think if we start having these conversations and it becomes more open in terms of like, yeah, it's totally cool if you change your mind. That allows queer people also to go on that journey and not get stigmatized within our own community because it feels like a threat from within. You know, it's like, oh my God, she was she was masked as a lesbian, but she actually likes men too, right? And, and mm-hmm. that's totally valid because lesbians get questioned all the time or queer people get questioned all the time. Is it a phase? Are you sure you don't just, you know, want to try to fuck me as a man? Like, I've had Ben come up to me and be like, I'm pretty sure I could change your mind. And I'm like, no, I don't. I really, really don't think so. I think I really don't, you know. When you when you identified as a lesbian. Even now. Hmm. Yeah, it doesn't like, identifying as a queer woman generally, I find that a lot of straight men are threatened by that. And... Mm-hmm. It's really, uh, you know, it's upsetting and it's hard to deal with. And I don't really have any answers about how to fix that other than to just like 
as a queer person, live in your authenticity and to do your best to kind of move on after those encounters. Mm-hmm. Um, and to talk about them afterwards so that people who are straight or, you know, cisgendered can listen to those and maybe not have those conversations in the future or, you know, stop their friends from having those conversations with queer women too. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of that layers into like, so many other things like feminism (laughs) and sexism but um yeah so those are some pretty big stigmas that I've I've faced in my life yeah Yeah, well I'm sorry I'm sorry that you went through that yeah me too I'm really sorry that you went through that but also grateful in a way because it's kind of been a part of your journey and it's made you the amazing human being that you are today so oh thanks yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I feel very much I for me. I think for me, um, because like you, I don't present the way that I identify in terms of yeah. my sexuality. Um, I don't really get a whole lot of feedback from it. But when I do claim it publicly, and when I do announce it publicly, I've had people make assumptions, um, mostly, and, and I say mostly, but uh, entirely straight men. Um, and there's two assumptions mm-hmm. that they make. The first one is, is that I am gay and I only like men. And the second one is, and that, that I'm just making it up with women. And then the second one is, is that because I identify as pansexual, that I'm immediately attracted to all men. Right. Oh. Which is, which is yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had people, even when I said, um, I've had friends that I've come out to and said, you know, hey, look, I identify as pansexual. And it's not like I'm coming out. It just comes up in conversation. And then, so at some point shortly after that, I, oh. I, I can remember two people specifically saying, so does that mean that you're attracted to me? And I'm like, dude, mm-hmm. I love you, but no. I still have a type, mm-hmm. y'all. Yeah, I still have a type and <laughs> yeah. not it, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, and, and to their credit, they were cool about it and they understood. But, but I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, that they, that, that, that hetero men, men that identify as heterosexual, not all, this is not an inclusive statement by any means, but, but the, the ones that give them the most flack identify as heterosexual male. Yeah. Uh, and there's an assumption made that because you are gay or because you are pansexual or you are anything other than what they are, that you're immediately attracted to them. And I think that says more about them than it does about me. It says more about their insecurities and their own fears and doubts and traumas and so on and so forth. And so well, and they're understanding about their uh, about the queer community too. Yeah, I exactly. Think exactly. It becomes sheltered on both sides, right? When there's not enough cross conversation between right. people who are not a part of the community and people who are, right. um, you get bubbles of people that with anything, right? So there are these bubbles of people who just have not been in contact with queer people in their lives at all and Mm -hmm. I've dated those people and it comes as a shock to them when I come you know barreling into their life (laughs) and and, that's a way to put it because it's a barrel truly like loud and (laughs) proud and queer and feminist and you know it hasn't worked out with those people but (laughs) who's to say why right like I I I, I, you know, and I'm sorry that you've gone through that too, but I, I think there has to be more conversations with people who are not a part of the queer community, just right. for like base emotional understanding and empathy between both communities, right? Uh-huh. So, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think I look at those as opportunities to, to educate. Yeah. Absolutely, you know, and it's like, no, that's not the way it works. It's it's like yeah. anything else, right? You know, you like blue cars, I like yellow cars, you know? Like, I mean, yeah. it's, just, it's just a matter of preference, really. And, and if I'm some people like all cars. And I say and I say to them, if I'm attracted to you, you'll know it. <laughs> so don't worry about yes. it. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Ivy, for thank joining us. Time. That was beautiful. And uh, you were our very first guest. Yay! Episode two is done. Uh, but please, before we go, would you oh, yeah. tell us about your project and how people can reach out to you? Sure. Um, I am the co-founder of the Open Letter Project uh, initiative. <laughs> it is a Calgary-based co-op for young writers, poets, um, and all peoples who need a space to express themselves. Um, we are on Instagram 
at Open Letter Project where you can submit um, a piece of writing. It can be a song, poem, whatever, um, in order to express yourself and also to destigmatize uh, mental health and uh, in encouraging positive coping mechanisms within people. So that's, that's my awesome. project. Thank um, you. Yeah. And, and you're also on Instagram, right? Yes, at Poison Ivy, I-V-E-H, <laughs> um, where I post a lot about queer things and queerness and acting and all the fun things that I do. So follow me on there for photos of my face and conversations about gayness. <laughs> awesome. That's that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for being here, Ivy. Thanks for having me, you guys. Great to see you again. Yeah, Yay. It's nice to see your beautiful face. <laughs> um, we're going to uh, do our next episode in two weeks' time, and we'll be talking about love languages. Fancy. And remember choose love and keep it kind. We'd love to hear your comments, questions, or topic suggestions, and remember to subscribe. And you're invited to join our Facebook group, Empowered Now Relationship Support and Advice for All. You can reach out to us on our websites at gregmillion.com and leannemillion.com or follow us on Instagram at gregmillion.lifecoach and at leannemillion.com.